The Hokies lost to Clemson 24 to 14. The first half set offensive football back maybe 40 <laughs> years. It was it was not good, but we were up seven nothing thanks to throwback uh to Beamer ball with the field goal block and run back by Quentin Reddish. Clemson scored on their first two drives of the second half. Then we had the interception. Clemson scored again, and it was done. We scored a garbage time touchdown, but uh that only sliced the and diced the lead to 10, and and it was over 24 to 14. A really disappointing game from the offense. Drones was bad. Schley was probably worse. The wide receivers dropped six balls. We, Sam, we clearly had injury stuff. And I don't want to talk a ton of the game before we get to the questions I have for Ryan, but like yeah. we only ran the two and four times and he had zero yards. And and feel free to jump in too, Ryan, if you want. But like I just felt like there was not a very good cohesive offensive plan for the, a, how to attack this good Clemson team. A complete and utter lack of under situational understanding of the game week of your team's health of your team's abilities of the opponent's strengths like did they watch any clemson film at all did they not know that basial tootin has a bum ankle did they not know that kyron drones has a bum ankle did they not watch colin schley play against syracuse like i am just so befuddled as to how you could be this out of touch with your own football team. Because it's not like we're asking very difficult things here. Like, no. we didn't really even expect them to win the game. I, I think there was some hope that we could win the game. It was under a touchdown spread. We both talked about how big of a spot it was for Pry, right. for the athletic department. Because it could be, like, he doesn't have a win like this in his mm. three years at Tech. Like, it would have, it would have potentially turned the corner for his tenure. We knew it yeah. was a little bit of a long shot, but we thought we had a chance if our guys played up to their ability. Well, Tootin was not himself and maybe mm -hmm. he had to go because Malachi couldn't play, but we saw Coney in the previous game. He ran tremendously well against Syracuse. I there's whispers that he was banged up. There's whispers that the freshman was banged up. Like, so really, if we're really hurt, if we have five running backs that are hurt and Tootin toughed it out, well, okay, maybe there's a little bit more of an excuse, but you've got other players that could run a jet yeah. sweep or something, and you decided yeah. to – you put them on the field. They're the guys that are playing, and it was one of the worst offensive performances we've had in the last decade. I think it was number four in success rate of the of the fourth worst. It was worse than the Wake Forest 0-0 zero, zero game, Ryan. Yes. That's, that's where we were at here. So um, just a really tough – a really tough performance and and the defense really got hung out to dry because yeah, they played, they played well. really well. They played yeah. really well. And if they had been given a chance to get off the field a little bit more with a better offense, we might've been able to hang in the game. There was the trick play and all that kind of stuff. We'll go into more on our Wednesday show, but stepping away from this loss individually, Ryan, as an outside observer, what is your take on VT being five and five with almost our entire roster coming back? And a lot of that preseason hype. I don't think there's any other way to put it, but it's like enormously disappointing. You know, the the Vanderbilt loss was stunning, but has gotten better with age. Like once once Vanderbilt beats Alabama and once they're hanging with Texas down to the point where if they recover an onside kick, they can potentially win the game. You can sort of like work your way back around to, you know, got surprised. By a the only, by, by like yeah, a the only way to get game. over the Vanderbilt loss was them to beat Alabama, and they did. Yes, and so right. we we are more right. or less over that. It right. sucked, but we are more right. or less over it. Yeah, I I mean, it, it mostly is. It's that thing where I think you nailed it, where you're sort of waiting for Virginia Tech to have under this under this administration to have that one signature win, and I think I think when you don't have that the longer it goes, the more it feels like, well, if we're just going to beat the teams that we're supposed to beat, and if that list doesn't get very long every year, and we're maybe going to drop us a, a game or two that we're not supposed to, you feel like you're spinning your wheels. You feel like you're not going like you watch what jo Georgia tech is not by record significantly better than Virginia tech is this year, but they just beat Miami and and they you know they they get that sort of signature. they're fun to watch yes yes <laughs> and and i think a lot of what it comes so much of where i've sort of landed on with 
the teams that I like have more confidence in than others is how much I get a sense of like what they're them having an, an identity that they believe in. Like, this is the other thing I really, to go back to Indiana, this is what I really like about Indiana. I don't think Indiana lines up out there and is like, ah, oh, God, let's try something and see what works. I think they say like, this is what we're going to do. If it doesn't work, we're going to try this instead. Like there is sort of a, a, a real sort of there's plan. a plan a and there's a plan b yes yes and plan and, a is a strong like you said a strong identity thing. yes yes vanderbilt has that too right now like v vanderbilt i know what a vanderbilt game is going to look like they lost to south carolina but that that largely came down to like yeah plan b is not that strong and plan a really matches up badly against mm -hmm. that south mm -hmm. carolina front four and front seven um lsu i think has a similar problem you know, like it's a, maybe a more first world problem in some ways, but LSU, I'm like, what is this offensive identity? Does it exist? It doesn't feel like it does. And I think Virginia Tech is one of those teams where it's like, you need to pick a lane and get everybody on board with it and just get everybody rowing in the same direction. And, and it hasn't felt that way in a while. Yeah, it does feel like they lack the, I like, Virginia Tech has been a good running team mm -hmm. this year, like a very good running team. And defensively, they've been pretty good, especially yeah. considering how much they've been held out to dry. So it's, okay, we're going to run the ball with our stud running back, and we have a mobile quarterback, and we're going to throw off play action, and we're going to play defense, and that's how we're going to win games. And then you go into games like this, and I understand you're beat up, but like you almost do the exact opposite of what your identity is. And this is similar to what they did a couple times early in the year against Marshall and against Rutgers. And those are really bad offensive performances. Like it's just baffling that they don't seem to have a very good grasp about what they are good at. And they don't seem to be able to see where the strengths are. And that really worries me because not only do we have like the clock mismanagement almost every single game or I mean he is know. he's a worse version of Cristobal with the clock stuff like it's <laughs> it's shocking. it's really bad it is shocking and it's like not only do you have those like procedural issues and they just don't look set up on the sidelines with communication and stuff like that but it's like a complete lack of understanding your own guys I don't know how you come back from that like I don't think new players helps that really because We've even if you bring in good players are they even going to see the field because we know they made a mistake with you know, starting Grant Wells over Kyron Drones, how are they not going to make that mistake for the next couple of guys? And it's just, I don't want to say said hopeless, this, but like, it doesn't look great right now. Sam nails it with that because it's, uh, the knowing what you have and knowing what you're good at. We started the first season under Pry with the wrong offense for six weeks and they admitted it. In the second year, they start Grant Wells instead of Kyron Drones. It takes us until the pick game to turn things on. This year, we're not running against Vanderbilt early on. We don't realize that Tootin's a generational back at Tech, and we we squander him until the v BC game. Not squander, but like we don't use him as much as we could or should. It took until the second half of Marshall to be like, you know what, we're good at run running the ball. Let's run it twelve straight times and win the game. And then the and every week we don't know if we're gonna get that, and it's it's extremely frustrating. But to to once again go to ten thousand feet. We have not won more than eight games since 2017. We've only done it twice since 2011. And that's two top 25 finishes in 13 seasons. And I'm counting this one because we're not going to finish in the top 25. Do you think it's fair for Hokies fans to expect to finish in the top 25 more than once every six years? Yes, honestly. <laughs> like that, that doesn't... It, it, there are so many fans and fan bases that have outsized expectations, but like that feels entirely within the realm of not only possibility, but like, I'm not going to say bare minimum, but it's definitely more on the minimum side than the maximum side mm -hmm. at this point. Um, you know, the ACC has not fallen so far from grace that putting up a good record can't get you ranked in the top. It's not, you know, it's not like you're playing in the Mac where you're like, Geez, we gotta we gotta win eleven games if we want to get. We had five the teams ranked five. last week. Yeah, right. the ACC did. Right, right, and and we've seen other teams. Like, how many other teams have we seen in that six year span have have a season where it's like, okay, like yeah, we ripped off, we ripped it off. Like, Wake Forest has had a good season. Pitt in that run. Pitt Pitt's won an ACC title not that long ago. 
NC State has had good runs. Like Georgia Tech looks like they are starting to put it back together to say nothing about what they were 10 years ago. Like, yeah, there is there is a sense of like, is it hard to win a conference title? Yes. Is it hard to go to the 14 playoff? Extremely. To get ranked in the top 25 on a somewhat consistent basis, like does feel like for a program like Virginia Tech should be a fifty percent of the time you should be doing it. And that does even that feels like I'm underselling it. You somewhere. know, if you look at the percentages, isn't like making the tournament in college basketball almost the same percentage of finishing in the top twenty five in football? Like you they're pretty and a lot of teams like make the tournament every year. And mm-hmm. if they don't, it's unsuccessful. And um for a for a, a school that sees themselves as a football school like that's what we see for better or for worse whether it's true or not we see ourselves as a football school and when we go through a drought like this what do you typically think is the issue and, and is it a matter it's cuz i don't necessarily think it's a matter of finding the right head coach do you think it's more of a systemic problem or is it just like if you find the right guy you'll you'll be fine i i <clears throat> This is so interesting because I think like what finding the right guy means is somebody who puts the right system in place. Like, I don't even think nece- like, look, what Dabba Sweeney built at Clemson when it was at its peak, and it's still like pretty close to the peak as it is now, was very little about like, wow, what a genius play caller he was. It was sort of a like, we're picking very specific lanes when it comes to recruiting. We're picking very specific lanes when it comes to who we're hiring on our staff and like what we're trying to do with that. I I think it all goes back to like a almost fanatical devotion to your identity, but it has to be an identity that is to Sam's point, like well-informed about where you're talented and where you can succeed. Like you can't just flip a switch and be like, you know what? We're an air raid team now. Everybody get out there and like we've seen teams try to do that. I mean, Wisconsin's of... kind of doing that right yeah, now. Yes, yeah. I mean, I I'm not confident Wisconsin's going to have the same offensive coordinator after this year, frankly. But yeah, I think I I don't think your identity needs to be fixed forever. Like I think there is some fluidity with it where, you know, if, if Virginia Tech decided like you know what we want to be a we want to score fifty points a game. I think as long as you put like the people in place and give it a little bit of time and sort of like stick to that plan, that's fine. But I think there are too many, the programs that struggle are the ones where I'm like, I don't know what you're trying to be. And I don't think, you know, either. And that to me does start at the head and sort of follows down from there. And the head being even the AD. I mean, it it goes, it goes all the way. Like there needs to be buy-in in what we are and what we're going to be from the top down. Yeah. Yeah, Sam, you had some. Yeah, I got a lot, Pete. I got a whole <laughs> lot. Uh, I do think it is too. When you are at this level of football, and you have the inexperience that Virginia Tech has had, not only with this era of, of the Brent Pry era, but also the Fuente era too. It's like the same problems, the same core problems, lack of offensive identity inability to land big recruits. I mean, we'll give Pry a couple more years for that inability to develop a quarterback and really, really inexperienced coordinators. I just think it is like Virginia. I see Virginia tech program 5,000 foot view making the same mistakes that they made with Justin Fuente and his staff. And it's like, how do you not learn from that? Like, look at what Indiana at like full circle, look what Indiana is doing with Kurt Signetti really experienced guy. They brought in a ton of experience with their coordinators. They brought in a ton of transfers who they knew what they were going to get. Like that is what works in college football outside of, you know, uh, you know what Oregon is doing and what Tennessee is able to do. I mean, there are and, like, a lot of ways the big to money succeed, programs like, but there are higher percentage options. <laughs> yeah. Think. Yeah. And it's, it's like, it's like first time head coach, two first time coordinators. It's the same, not thing. high percentage. You know? Tennessee, yeah, Tennessee is such a good example, too, because you look at this team now that, like, could play for the SEC title, could make the playoff. They look totally different from the team that beat Alabama a few years. Like, they, yeah. they didn't decide, like, we can only be one thing. And if we can't, like, if we don't have three NFL wide receivers and we're not bombing it down the field all day long, we can't. They've just 
side of we're going to have one of the greatest running backs in program history, and we're going to win with defense, and we're going to slow the game way, way down. Like, that to me is such an impressive mark of, like, understanding your roster. Hypo's, understanding yeah. how Hypo's you can awesome. put them in a position to succeed. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So you're not going through the exact thing that Virginia Tech's going through, <laughs> but it is kind of similar. I mean, yes. this oh, is I your... mean, the, the like, identity list. And the, I feel like, like that's mistakes. why I yes. ask you about some of this stuff, because you are on – your fourth straight year of not finishing in the top 25 must not champ. even, not even getting a winning record at this point. <laughs> must champ McIlwain Mullen and Napier. None of them getting more than four years and Napier might be added to that list. Yeah. And I feel like in some ways Mullen was our Fuente in that like those guys could coach football, but they kind of sent so- the, the relationships and the recruiting down the toilet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then Napier is pry in some ways, like the players like him. He's like, I don't know how good Napier is with the media, but like there's generally good feelings within the building about who he is, but like, there's just a lot of other stuff that we don't like. And I'm wondering like, we may be on the verge of the same things like that. That's kind of what I'm getting at. And I do appreciate your perspective on all of it because I feel like where we are and what's happened, we need, we need new direction from the athletic department. Mm-hmm. That That's kind of what I'm getting at. And I'm wondering if that's where you're at with Florida right now. Oh, hundred. Uh, yes. A hundred percent for a variety of reasons. And like you go through that list and my, The thing that I think has sunk them over this time is almost all of those hires from must from after must champ forward. They're all reactive. They're all, well, what did the last guy fail at? Like McIlwain gets hired because must champ can't put an offense together. And then, you know, Mullen gets hired because McIlwain doesn't want to be there and is like not excited to be a Florida football coach. But Dan Mullen, you know, who was offensive coordinator on a national championship team, very excited, very happy to be there. And then Napier gets hired because Dan Mullen can't recruit. And that's what Billy Napier can do. And and to me, it's just like if you're constantly trying to fix last year or two years ago's problem, you're never actually figuring out what you are going forward. Like you can't fix two years ago recruiting class. It's gone. It's done. Give it up. I mean, Tech did kind of hire the polar opposite personality of Justin. Ford. They did. Yes, they did. Like they, they got hired... a defensive coach with a personality. And, and this is the where, like, and, and I know the guys on the Athlon Cover Two podcast have talked about this for a few years now. But like, fit is proving to be a really overrated term in college football. Yes, because fit only works in press conferences. When you get on the field, you need guys who can win football games and get guys ready to play football and. That I think is something that is a very, very difficult thing for athletic directors to get to, to, to look past the winning the press conference and towards winning the football game. And I think where Virginia Tech is right now, it's like we have someone who can win the press conference. We either need to help them out a whole lot with the football thing or look another direction. Like it's it's a really tough spot to be in. Yeah. Last question for Ryan. We've got Duke and UVA left on the schedule. We are five and five. Do we get to a bowl? Do we win one more and get to a bowl? Remind me again what Virginia's record is, if you would. Just, They're just five and four. They okay. just beat Pitt. Okay. So we are hurtling towards the doomsday scenario of Commonwealth <laughs> Cup decides who goes to a bowl and who doesn't. A tradition yep. unlike any other. A tradition <laughs> truly unlike any other. Uh and and so I'll flip it back on you. Do you think y'all are going to beat UVA this year? If you say yes, then yes, you're going to make a bowl game. If you say no, no, you're going to stay home. P, how be. old was I when Tech last <laughs> lost to UVA in Blacksburg? This is going to make me feel very Oh, old. God. You were... It's 2004, I think? No, we won the ACC in 2004. It was 2003. 2003. No, 2000, 2003 was in... Um, 2003 was in Charlottesville. Oh, then you might have not been alive, Sam. <laughs> like, you really might have I might have not been alive. Because <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure UVA was like number one the year that they did it, right? It's 1998. 1998. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, that was the one. That They were one. They were number one that year at one point, And then they ended up losing a bunch of games. This you many were, years. You were one years old. <laughs> um, that was the, the debut year of Sex in the City, 1998. 
<laughs> so that's like tech's not losing. Like that is the first game in Black the tech you first tech UVA game in Blacksburg in front of France since 2018. Tech's not losing that game. They tech can't is lose not that losing that game. And and I know they got a nice win, but Pitt is not that good. And also, that a, had like that was a weird win. They that had like a, a thirty. He had a thirty six QBR and won that yeah. game. Like he passed. I mean, it was good. it was an awful game. Like Utah Utah's AD fl- flipping out over a defensive holding call. Pitt had a fourth and one stop that got reversed because the referees said they weren't lined up properly and they let UVA run the play again. And they like, it, that's what you get on the mic and say you're furious about. Yeah. It actually should have been a five yard penalty on UVA. <laughs> if you look at the rule book, it's a five yard penalty. If you snap the ball before the refs are in position, See Utah, it could be so much worse. What are you complaining about? <laughs> Well, Ryan, this is a nice compliment to get you out of here. Mitchie says this pod has been awesome, guys. Thank you, Mitchie. Thank you for for listening and for the commentary. Ryan, I want to ask you, what do you got going on? I know you're doing many different shows. You got yeah. something going on with Godfrey as well, yes, which has yes. been pretty cool. Why don't you yes. tell the people what's going on with you? Uh, we're doing. He and I are working on a little six part uh, narrative. Uh, podcast called who killed college football we're looking at all the powerful entities in college football how they have shaped the sport into what it is today we just released our nfl episode where we got to talk for a little bit to scott pioli who was part of those patriot helped build those patriot teams and was the gm in kansas city for a while uh our next episode is about coaches and agents and how they have shaped the game of college football so you can look for that if you just look up who killed college football wherever you listen to this show uh shutdown forecast still going we're not all like this still going and yeah, probably some other stuff that I'm forgetting, but if there's, if there's a shutdown full cast has been wild lately. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it's been helpful that we've had some, we've had some interesting results to go with. And I like, look, is there anything that can help better explain what college football is than LSU fans are mad because the governor brought in a fake tiger <laughs> Dude, and then they and then they got hammered. Yeah, I didn't know if this show was going to touch on that, but that was amazing. <laughs> wow! Like of all the things to spend your time as as the governor of a state. That's right. That's right. Not a popular decision, and I'm sure losing that game decisively did not help either. LSU, Louisiana is about to lead the nation in animal rights activism That's here right. in a few That's weeks. Right. That's right. Well, thank you so much for being here, Ryan. Uh, yeah, truly thanks, someone Ryan. that that I've admired in the podcast space. And it's an honor to have you. I've had uh, your other co-host, um, Spencer Hall, joined us last year. And that was that was great. And if I'm not mistaken, he's a Florida guy too. Like, did you guys meet oh, yeah, in college or something? No, he's, listen, he, A, he's much older than I am. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, no, he has the beard. I can't really tell how old he's, he is. He's, age, he's ageless like Santa Claus. That's true. <laughs> okay. um, no, we didn't meet in college, but uh, God, we're both, if you want to talk to like two miserable Florida fans, just get on a group text with me and Spencer. It's unbearable. <laughs> it's truly unbearable. Is, is uh, the split zones, uh what's his name? Richard, Richard, sure. Richard Johnson. Yeah. Richard, Richard Johnson. Johnson. Yeah. Is he on there too? Uh, is, he, he oh, is, is he on the group chat? <laughs> I think he is a little bit more measured at this point okay. than we are. Okay. But we're. I think that's just because we're old and cranky and he still has youth and vibrance. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, I have no more youth and vibrance. Uh, we're going to let you get out of here so we can finish the show before it's bedtime. All right. And uh, we thank you very, very much for coming on. Thank and- you both for having me. Pleasure talking to both of y'all.